wi da slu har ton to roni kuen agar wen toren tuen na wen trau voluntas an voluntas voluntish come on all right yes mishandro kira agis uh well <sighs> She and Quailig and Chaga Barry from Andoa. I mean, Shen and Kush go will mail a stage here. The Irish language originally was an old language which was only spoken, so it was an oral language. And the, you can kind of look at the history of the Irish language in three sections. So the first section would be just the oral part of the language. It was a communal language, it was a very poor, poor country. So the language was formed around the culture, which is how language is created. Irish was the language of all Ireland at one stage, uh, one of the family of Celtic languages spoken throughout Northern Europe before we had any of the modern European languages, uh, spoken back at the time, except for, I mean, Latin has come and gone, Greek is still around, but uh, it was around the time of those languages. The Celtic language and it's um, one of the oldest uh, surviving vernacular languages in Europe as well. So in the old language, our first part of the Irish language, there's certain phrases that we say, such as, um, the shovel is with me, the coal is with me, the, um, the car is with me. And that comes from that communal part of the language where they were so poor, nobody owned everything individually, they shared things in the village. And then the second phasing of the Irish language, it, we started to document it and we started to write it down. And we started to work in a lot of the Latin influence. So when Irish started to be written down and documented, a lot of the words came in that are based on Latin, such as lower from the Latin verb le, which means book in Irish, and to read is lay. That second phase of the Irish language, when it started to be documented, and those strong Latin influences, we see a definite shift there, and the, and the vocabulary exploded. And then the third part of the Irish language is modern Irish, where we bring in lots of English words like the email into our spoken language, like I'll send them a text, you know, pop text to gum. So we use modern words in our modern language. Well, I mean, spoken in Ireland, I mean, we have a few areas, the Gaeltic areas, but on the west of Ireland, to me it was always, there are more remote areas of Ireland, anywhere the invaders, the English, were not interested in, there was nothing economically worth taking there. So that's kind of the last areas that Irish. So they've designated them in Ireland as Gaeltic areas where a quarter of the population is meant to speak Irish or speak it on a daily basis, but they're becoming a lot more bilingual and that 20% is probably in decline. Um, and it's very much a minoritized language in Ireland. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the pr um, percentages are, but um, the number of, um, I think it's about one million um, citizens in Ireland can speak Irish, but the number of daily speakers will be a lot less than that. And it's like everything in Ireland, even the attitudes the Irish or the language or people can speak it. I always say there's about a third of the people that can speak it. There's about a third of the people might understand you speaking it to them. And then by another topic, Third, I might tell you where to go with yourself if you spoke it to. Now, Ireland is peculiar. It's you can say it falls into a range of categories where language is concerned. Uh, it falls into kind of the higher end of languages. In there's a million and a half people claiming to be able to speak it in the last census. Uh, a fraction of those answer the question that they speak it on a uh, once in, in a week on a weekly basis. It's unusual in the language that if you have over a million speakers, I mean, that's that's a strong language. That's one of the top languages in the top uh, quartile. Um, but then on the other hand, when you get down to the people that actually speak it, then it drops way down the chain altogether. Irish people might say to you, how good is your Irish? Can you talk to me in Irish? Or, I, you know, and they kind of look at you to kind of figure out if you're really good at your Irish or not. Um, so I think there's an expectation that once you say you're Irish, you should be able to speak Irish. At the turn of the last century, still over 45% of the population spoke it just before the famine. But at that point, because you couldn't get a government job and people were thinking of emigrating, the language was no longer seen. Irish was seen as, as a language of prosperity. All my crops and my sheep and cattle died. 
The rents and taxes were to pay And I could not them redeem And that's the cruel reason I left old Skibbereen it was in decline before the famine and they'd see the famine as maybe a catalyst um, that would have reduced or led people, encouraged people to leave the language behind and I suppose because so many, the famine was so, so traumatic and so many people died. So it was mostly more the poor people that spoke it and uh, when a famine came who gets hurt most? The poor people. So a million people died during the famine, another million and a half emigrated. We definitely see a kink in the formation of the language through the famine. A lot of vocabulary is lost, a lot of documentation was lost, nothing was written down for 50 years. And people just didn't have the energy to write. Penal laws, English invaders, legislated against Irish, you couldn't get a job in government if you spoke Irish. It was not allowed taught in the school system. Um, so they basically, I mean, there was a practice, not just of Irish, but pretty much the entire culture, her heritage, genocide and cultural heritage, dress, dancing, music, everything. So um, that went on for hundreds of years. Um, one of the biggest reasons why Irish was kept alive was because the native people could speak it and the English people couldn't. So it was a way that we, we passed messages and we, we spied and we kept it alive in that way. If you went to school, they have a little stick hanging around their necks and a piece of twine. If you were caught speaking Irish, you got a notch in it. And uh, at the end of the day or the end of the week, you got beaten so many times for how many notches you have. You know, a slap for each notch. In Ireland, the minority language, Irish, is the national language. When they wrote the Constitution, they said Irish is the national language. And that changed a little bit uh, a number of years ago when they had the good peace agreement in Northern Ireland. And now where English is also a national language in Ireland. So both those languages at this stage uh, are, are considered uh, national languages. They went back to legislating that it be a subject in school, not the means of teaching, but one subject out of all the subjects to be taught in school. From when you're five years old until you're 18 years old, you, you learn Irish um, in the school system. Um, and that means that everyone technically has a, a, an understanding of Irish. You have to study Irish in high school in, in um, Ireland to pass high school. You're not allowed, if you fail Irish, you fail everything. But that's not to say that people actually use the language when they leave the classroom. Um, and that's the problem, I suppose, with the language um, where, where English is the dominant language of the, of the country. When I studied Irish in the 70s and the 80s in Ireland, it was terribly boring. And learning a language in school was taught in a very boring manner. It was taught with a lot of rote learning, a lot of memorization, um, a lot of uh, reading and writing. When I was finishing up high school, around 89, the school system had just brought in uh, language tests where you had to speak and start learning and listening a lot more to. So thank God there was a shift from a boring way to learn a language to a more realistic way of learning a language. And um, as a result, language learning became a lot easier. You can buy Harry Potter in Irish, there's cartoons in Irish, there's just so much you can do. Oh, mm, mm, uh, foggy may crust the dit. Tore a ration pillow or... Shit more failure, cheek my ass! Ach, his mission teach her crew ich hütte er. The Gael talks, which are what we call our summer camps in Ireland, where you go live with a family for a month and you do all kinds of fun stuff in Irish. Mostly they exist on the west coast of Galway, Donegal and Kerry. Those were areas where everybody as students would go in the summer and you would spend three weeks and you'd speak Irish and what a great experience that was. And almost every kid I ever knew went to the Gael Talked in the summer to help them with their Irish. And you know, you used to live with a band tea in her house and do Irish dancing and do um, just great sessions all the time as kids.
there is a huge um, interest in the Irish language in urban centres um, and you'll find that even in Belfast and in Dublin there's a huge number of Irish speakers and there are urban Gaelsochti and um, part of this is connected to the um, the movement of Gaelskullna or Irish language immersion schools so now children from the, from that age actually not only learn Irish in school but take all of their subjects through Irish and um, so if they're studying maths or science and um, even if they're studying another language, they'll be learning that language through Irish. And there's probably twice as many of those schools or three times as many in primary level than there is at uh, the secondary level or uh, what you call junior high schools here. And then it's beginning to become more popular colleges to teach. Um, there are parents who are very passionate about it and speak the Irish at home. And then there are parents and I have nephews going to school and and when I spoke Irish to them after learning they were going to the all Irish schools, you'd have thought I had grown a second head. It's like, why are you speaking Irish to me? We're not in school. So they don't speak it at home, but they are learning to speak it. So once they warmed up, they were able to speak Irish to me. And it was quite an enjoyable experience. There has been this kind of movement in the last number of years to make Irish cool and make Irish trendy. Um, and um, just this week, actually, um, TG Car, which is the Irish language radio or TV station, um, was celebrating their 20 year anniversary. I think I've actually grown up as one of those um, keeping Irish trendy kind of um, uh, children. So I, I was saying. Uh, recently that I actually remember being on TG Cahar when I was six years old when they just um, set up the station and going into the studio um, and I suppose I grew up with that idea that Irish leads to so many um, other job opportunities in the future including um, TV or radio. So they have some dramas and they have them subtitled which is really nice it's great for learning um, so you have uh, cartoons for kids you have a teenage soap opera, there was one on called Africa that was pretty interesting. And then Ross Naroon is, is kind of been going, it's like the East Enders of England, Coronation Street, or, oh, I can't, couldn't name the names of them in this country, unfortunately. Uh, one of the good days of our lives, or I'm not sure. But it's a soap opera that's been going on there for about 14 years. It was a very positive language to have. Um, I'm not sure if that was the case maybe for generations before this because they didn't have this infrastructure. So I think I'm, I'm one of the products of that kind of movement and I think that's um, growing um, day by day. You can see on YouTube as well with all these um, um, students in, who go to the summer camps doing cover versions of popular pop songs in Irish and then loading them up onto um, YouTube and some of them have, have had over have millions of views. <laughs> There's a group up in Connemara called T.G. Lorgan, and they translated a, a pop song from English to Irish. And then they had like three to 500 kids in the video, and it was, you know, they had gymnasts and dancing and Irish dancing and music and everything. And it was brilliant, and they put it up on YouTube and it went viral. And since then, they've put out at least 100 pop songs in Irish. And it's really, really fascinating to see all the kids enjoying it and having a great time with it. And I'd like to see that get a little bit further played. She mastering the lurking of the war of shade, she towering queen. So, like my seer on Sumar, spawn and bow her is a carom. Bon and me can't scribe a mach, she mine, give it to the ring. So, like my seer on Sumar, spawn and bow. So now you have other areas, you have the radio, you have the TV, you have all of these media and you have the kids in school. So on one end you've got this uptick in Irish going on, you've got a downtick over here and now you've got an uptick over here. But overall, going up very slowly, but it's kind of unfortunate at this stage after 100 years trying to watch the, the glaciers melt. I suppose just kind of naturally uh, going from, you know, even what I knew growing up, there was that initial interest, so I, I naturally kind of gravitated towards Irish-American history and Irish identity in America and in places like England and London and Glasgow, um, you know, where there's what they call the Irish diaspora, you know, people born to Irish families but outside of Ireland. In terms of specific numbers, I think the, the largest probably emigration wave, um, certainly everybody in America knows of, the, you know, the, the emigration wave after the famine, um, 
you know, you have waves of Irish immigrants. They say, I think some numbers, one and a half million or a million uh, come over to North America at that time, which is staggering. Um, and as we see, a majority of them would have been Irish speaking, uh, something that's not always recognized in the, you know, the histories, the past histories that have been done. And then even in the 40s and 50s, uh, speaking to a lot of Irish immigrants in even the Hartford, Connecticut area, you hear them talk about the 49ers. Uh, and they're not talking about a football team, but they're talking about the massive wave of immigrants that came into Hartford in 1949. Uh, so many of them left Ireland, they'd say, you know, the last one to leave, turn off the lights. <laughs> and uh, they ended up in places, you know, industrial hubs like Springfield, Mass, Worcester, Hartford, all around these spots. You know, in the 19th century, a lot of them were trying to assimilate to a certain extent. Um, and I think Irish at that time was probably seen as a language of, you know, their the kind of oppressed past, maybe a past that they were trying to get away from in certain certain respects, um, in, in certain communities anyway. Um, amongst the, the, the older the generation in the 20th century, I think a lot of times it was they wanted their kids to be Americanized. Um, and that's certainly something that, you know, you would have seen in my dad's generation was, and he was told many a time around the table, you know, he'd, he'd ask, you know, the Irish lessons to go a bit further of what he was just hearing naturally and they'd say you don't need to know that you're American. My great-grandparents were on my father's side were Irish but unfortunately when they came over and the discrimination and the just the cultural um, disdain that Native Americans had, uh, Native born Americans had, for the Irish you didn't really, there wasn't really a lot of Irish pride so it really wasn't spoken about so it wasn't until my wife started doing the genealogy and started to uncover where, what names, where, who is from, that it really started to interest me. Because as I said, um, you, in the 1920s, you weren't running around, you know, bragging about the fact that you were Irish because as we've seen in, in history books, you know, no Irish need apply and, and there was a lot of discrimination. So um, that was part of our family history that was really not even thought about or talked about. Not that they were ashamed of it, but just it had sort of just faded into the background. One of the things I think that Irish people are quite um, um, focused on is getting a good education and assimilating with a good education. So learning Irish may not be high the priority. You know, I want you to go into American high school, be excellent at math, be excellent at science. So I think generally the Irish community has focused on success in the school system plus assimilation, not necessarily isolation. I know a woman in Hartford who would be in her 80s now, and she often talks about, you know, she's in my parish, and she was, she's from the Aran Islands, and she didn't have a word of English when she came off the boat. So um, and she would have came in the 50s. And so she said she was sent over to live with an aunt, and you know, she was totally alienated even from the Irish community here because she could speak with the other Irish speakers, but besides that, there was nothing. So she, she made a very conscious effort to learn English. And now it's interesting that when I go over her house, go over for tea, she's asking me if some of the things she says in Irish are correct because she, she made a conscious effort to drop her Irish. Um, and now she, you know, listens to Radio and the Glaive talk and things. But um, yeah, it's kind of sad. She always says, you know, I wish everybody in the world spoke one language. And it's just a, a wild, you know, kind of statement when you really think about it. It's sad. Basket Island, one of the last places, you know, they're speaking Irish. They came and I heard that there was a street up in Springfield, Massachusetts, where they spoke Irish. Because there was an awful lot of people at Basket Island. I went up there looking for it. I couldn't find it. <laughs> they speak Irish in areas in Nova Scotia now. There's also a lot of Scots Gaelic up there in there. Scots Gaelic. But in, you go to Nova Scotia, there's places. And there were even places down in West Virginia in the Appalachian Mountains where there were pockets of people speaking Irish and you get a lot of the Irish music came out of there. Irish classes are popping up all around uh, the U.S. So I think, you know, it's maybe the generations down the line that are really the ones that are re-engaging with, you know, the language and certain elements of the culture, whether it's dancing, um, you know, or what have you. Um, I've been doing a lot of research into the Irish speaking community in Springfield Mass and also the Gaelic revival at the start of the 20th century. In Springfield Mass they actually had Irish classes running from the 1870s and um, where um, students in the local schools were learning Irish um, that, that early on I suppose and there are still classes being taught to this day so I think that's really something that isn't recognised maybe um, when we think about um, Irish American history. So when I was in Springfield I also interviewed um, some of the oldest Blasket Islanders um, because um, 
when the Blasket Island, when the islanders left the island in the 1940s, a lot of them emigrated to Springfield and they already had connections in Springfield. Um, but the Blasket Islands is an, I is an island off the west coast of um, Kerry. And it, what was really interesting talking to these islanders was that even when they were in school in the Blasket Islands, they knew more about American history than about Irish history. So they nearly grew up with this culture that they would be emigrating and probably to Springfield where they had aunts or uncles that could help them as they set up when letters arrived from their relatives in the States, they'd put the letters up um, beside the, the candle to see if there was any dollars they could see through in the letter, because <laughs> that was the most important thing, that they, they grew up on this kind of culture of being, receiving gifts from, from the States. Um, I, I spent a lot of time particularly with um, a man called Mike Carney, or Michal O'Carna, who actually published a book um, called From the Blasket Islands um, to America. Um, which is it's readily available in bookshops and it, it, it kind of gives a, an insight into his life on the Blasket Islands and also the reasons why he had to leave. This kind of close net um, community from the Blasket Islands in the West Kerry literally just kind of upped and moved and landed back into um, Hungry Hill in Springfield and they kept those relations with their family um, in Springfield and um, they would have been very, very um, tight um, all, and their children would have grown up together. And, and they really retained that culture as well. Um, I got into teaching a number of years ago because I went home and my brother was looking after a five-year-old that was going to a Grail school in Ireland. And I was able to look at the girl and I was a horrendous student in Ireland. But so I was like, what's the word for floor and ceiling and wall? And this five-year-old girl knew all these words. And I was like, oh, that's fascinating. So I came back here to, this, to America and I joined the Irish class at this club. Uh, within six months, I was teaching the class, not because I was particularly great. We have a, a saying in Ireland called Itir na Dao is ri and din In the land of the blind, the king is the man with one eye. So the fact that I could pronounce the words meant that I was I became the teacher. Students whose parents were Irish speakers, they'd know all of the um, uh, words like do and thirst, close the door, or na be dona, don't be bold, ish the veil shut your mouth, you know, any of those kind of words would be the words that they'd know from growing up. So it's really um, endearing and it's particularly other words like um, um, La Amadon, a lot of them heard, which is, oh, you little Egypt, which they would have had their parents saying if they were bold as they were kids. So it's, it's quite interesting in that sense. So I was teaching at a liberal arts college um, where students were obliged to take a language um, for credits. Um, so a lot of students decided rather than take Spanish or Japanese um, to do something new like Irish that they hadn't um, studied before and also because a lot of them had connections to the language or to the, to the culture as well. Um, it was really interesting teaching students who were really enthusiastic about the language. Ever since I was a little kid I knew there was such a thing as the Irish language. Now of course the older generation in my family called it Gaelic all the time and would actually correct me if I called it Irish. In college one of the girls in my Russian class had relatives, Irish-speaking relatives in Donegal, and she brought back clanid records before they were well known here. So, you no, know, we used to listen to them in her room and everything, and then that was kind of my first introduction, and really got me into traditional music. <laughs> I find the language difficult because there are so many letters and vowels that uh, don't look like anything, you know, you can't look at the words and pronounce them because they're not a romance language and I took Spanish in high school so it's, it is completely different than what I'm used to but it's been fun, a lot of fun. Irish is a lot more different so it's more difficult, it's a lot stranger. It has been very challenging <laughs> and it has definitely stretched my mind. Uh, my family is actually from West Cork uh, on the Mizzen Peninsula, so about as far southwest as you can go in Ireland. 
um, and they all would have been Irish speaking going back. Um, but unfortunately, I didn't get the West Cork Irish. Uh, it stopped being passed down in my dad's generation. Um, he was born in Hartford as well. Um, so I actually learned my own Irish um, on a construction site in America here, which is probably not the most typical uh, place. And uh, yeah, I, I learned it actually from a, a fellow from the north. I suppose it was kind of always in the background um, is I suppose the way that we would have kind of put it. Um, even I know my dad would have taught us all the kind of some phrases growing up and my grandmother when we'd go in her house, uh, we always had at least a smattering of Irish. It was always just kind of there. Uh, if you wanted a cup of tea or you know you weren't asked how you were it was always Constantu and Tommy Gama and everything um, and they would kind of inter they put a lot of Irish words into their English so you kind of had that um, so I suppose that you know even subconsciously there was that desire to learn the learn the language um, so it's it's quite unique and it's rather fun to learn Irish and I think that's one of the reasons why we do it it's a, it's a bragging right it's a bit of fun. The language is associated with drinking, having fun, you know, having a party. <laughs> um, and I think that's why people like to learn it here. So I kind of identify with it being a tongue that is belonged to my ancestors and I continue to learn it and enjoy it for that reason. How do you understand the stories of the Shanaki? How do you understand the, the whole process and the concept of the pubs and storytelling and socializing unless you understand the history a little bit of the Irish language and how we got to that point. So it opens up your mind and your brain to the culture but you do have to study a language to understand a culture um, and that's one of the things I think America is a little weak on. The more they study the language the more the culture lights up for them. Um, it's kind of an emotional question because you do grow up with that people saying oh it's a dead language it's useless um, and I think uh, my experience has been totally the opposite of that, uh, in that Irish always leads to new opportunities. Um, I th and I think even being over in the States and you see how the language is, is um, developing um, and how it's so important for so many people is really, really encouraging. So, Irish is not at all a dead language because the government is protecting it and the government is making sure that we continue to keep it alive. So it doesn't actually fall under the umbrella of dead languages.